and our theme this evening is abortion is it murder abortion is it murder I want to say first of all that this question is a question of great gravity that infants could be routinely, routinely and legally murdered in a supposedly civilized society is a sign of great ungodliness and must surely be offensive to the Most High God. Now let us just get some idea of the size of the question. Of course, any murder is serious, but multiple murder is more so. In England and Wales, according to the figures that I have at least, the number of abortions in 1995 was 162,447 and in 1996 177,225 also in England and Wales in 1995 90,000 embryos were generated by in vitro fertilization and disposed of immediately without use now, this is then an immense, a uh, question of immense proportions. Now, we might be confused into thinking that this has something to do with saving the lives of mothers from certain death. This is not the case. Even if it could be shown biblically that a mother has a greater or prior claim to preservation over the child and we have not seen this done then all, and so if that could be established which we haven't seen done and therefore ground could be given for medical interference resulting in the death of the child to save the life of the mother that would presuppose that doctors are in a position to infallibly uh, determine that the death of the mother will certainly result if the, abortion, if the abortion does not take place and yet there are many cases where the doctors who predicted certain death to the mother if she does not have an abortion have been proved wrong and the mother has lived and the child has lived and uh, I know of one case personally in England where a Christian mother refused to have an abortion she was told that if she didn't she would die she was harassed throughout the time in hospital uh, to try to persuade her to have an abortion she consistently refused she lived and the child lived and they were both healthy thereafter so let's not think that this really has anything to do with saving mothers' lives from certain death. Not even many claims are even made for that. Because these figures that I've quoted to you have nothing to do with preserving mothers from certain death and scarce ever is that even claimed. The breakdown of the 1995 figures which I mentioned is as follows. There are several uh, legal categories that doctors can mention as the reason for the abortion. Now sometimes they give more than one reason. But let me give you the 1995 uh, figures broken down. The first reason, risk, risk to the mother's life. 127 the second reason to prevent grave permanent injury to the mother 2,353 the third reason a risk to the mother's physical or mental health 156,721 the fourth reason a, ri a risk to existing children's health 13,482 the fifth reason, a substantial risk of serious disability of the child, 1,828. The 
Uh, sixth reason, in emergency to save the mother's life. Nil. And the seventh reason, in emergency to prevent grave permanent injury to the mother. Nil. So the abortion movement really has nothing to do with saving mothers from certain death, even if that could be justified. It has to do with the desire to pursue by means of selected killing of infants in the womb the futile quest for risk-free, handicap-free and even inconvenience-free childbearing. That is what it has to do with. The futile pursuit of what God has never promised risk-free, handicap-free and even inconvenience-free childbearing. And of course the trend in Northern Ireland is not as far behind as uh, England and is not as far behind England and Wales as is generally imagined. The law is not that much tighter. In 1995, for example, 1,545 women from Northern Ireland went to England for abortions. But abortions are taking place in Northern Ireland. Occasionally this comes to light in particular instances. There was the K case in 1993 where a mother threatened suicide and as I understand it the abortion was allowed on the ground to a th of a threat to the mother's life. But the only threat was that she said she would commit suicide. Uh, there was the A case in 1994, a mentally handicapped mother, which received some public atten uh, attention. Public opinion in Northern Ireland has tended to check a liberal interpretation of the existing laws, but this is changing. And in any case, there are strong attempts to change the Northern Ireland law, which doesn't outlaw abortions as rigorously as people imagine, but there are attempts to change those laws anyway. And the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, proposed under the Stormont Agreement, is well placed to bring this about. The Stormont Agreement has an effect on a whole range of things that people don't realise. And Dr Jenny Tong, the Liberal Democrat MP, has already raised this matter in the House of Commons of making sure that women in Northern Ireland have the same access to abortion as in England uh, and uh, Wales. So then, is this legitimate progress or is it legalised wholesale murder? If abortion is murder, then doctors and mothers are killing more people than all the terrorists put together. It is less obvious, the pain caused by it less apparent. But if abortion is murder, then far more human beings are being murdered by the abortionists than by the gunmen. One thing should be clear. If the infant in the womb is a human being, then these abortions do amount to murder. And so the question we must ask is, do the scriptures teach that the child in the womb, from conception onwards, is a human being and to be treated as such? So we turn to the scriptures and I don't want to spend a lot of time on facts and figures and cases and so on. It's the Lord's Day and I particularly want to stick close to the scriptures. First of all then, God is made known to us in general and special revelation. God is made known to us in general and special revelation. This may seem a strange point to start at, but you'll see the relevance as we go on. 
God is made known to men in general revelation and in special revelation. What do we mean by that? By general revelation, we mean God's works of creation and providence which tell us of his eternal power. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans 1 verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That is, there's no excuse for the pagans thinking of God as they do in verse 23 when they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Even without a Bible or any part of the Bible, the creation declares that God is not like uh, birds and four-footed beasts and man and so on. Psalm 19, part of which we sang, speaks of this general revelation in creation and providence. Psalm 19 verse 1 The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun and go so on. In verses 1 to 6 of Psalm 19 we are being told that God's glory is displayed in the creation. And as we see God's handiwork and his government of it, we ought to know that God is eternal and almighty. And so the pagan who worships that which uh, is finite and the image of uh, creatures as if they were God is without excuse for that sin. But this general revelation though it tells men and they ought to learn from it that God is almighty and eternal it does not tell men how to be saved from their sins general revelation the glory of God in the creation does not tell sinners how to be forgiven so in Romans 10 13 to 15 the apostle Paul says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom him, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of them that preach glad tidings of good things. There must be special revelation. That is, the, re the revelation of God in Holy Scripture, the written word. We need biblical truth to know the way of salvation. And so Psalm 19, having spoken of general revelation in the creation, moves on in verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. We need the written word of God, special revelation it's often called, in order to know the way to heaven. The glory of God in the creation does not tell us how to find forgiveness of sins. It is God speaking at sundry times and in divers manners to the fathers by the prophets and in these last days by his Son. That tells us the way of salvation. Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 2. Secondly, science is the detailed study of general revelation. Science is the detailed study of general revelation. When those of us who are not scientists go into the countryside and we are amazed at the beauty of it, we see the beauty of the handiwork of God. And if we're Christians, we rightly see in the creation, as we look at it in the light of the Holy Scriptures, we see the glory of God displayed in it. Now the unbeliever sees something of the beauty of it, but he holds down the truth in unrighteousness. 
He does not glorify God when he sees God's glory displayed in the creation. He finds an alternative explanation for that glory and that beauty. But what the non-scientist sees in this general, simple way, the scientist explores in great detail. The scientist is studying general revelation which the rest of us only have a vague and general appreciation of in all its, uh, all its immense detail and intricacy and complexity. So the glory of God displayed in the creation which we see only in general, the scientist sees in its detail under the microscope and with all the equipment and his careful close study of uh, the created world. And if the scientist is a Christian, then he will do this in submission to the word of God written and he will do so to the glory of God and as he discovers more and more of the intricacy of the things that God has made his admiration for God will increase. Now then, thirdly, scripture, not science, teaches us concerning the presence of the soul. Scripture not science teaches us concerning the presence of the soul of man. From the word go we must not concede too much to the scientist. We're not to be cowed because we're not scientists. He may be able to declare when he can detect physical life but he cannot without the written word of God either define a human life or declare when there is human life uh, in the full sense of the word he can only look at the physical side of human life in other words the presence of the soul is not something that can be scientifically detected it is not the province of the scientist to say when the soul is present or not present. We are to turn to the word of God to understand what a human being is and when human life begins. The scientist can tell us when there is physical human life but the scriptures tell us when the soul of man is present in that life. And under this consideration let us learn the Christian view of human life differs from that of the atheist. The Christian view of human life differs from that of the atheist. For the atheist human life is purely physical. For the atheist man doesn't have a soul. The physical is all that there is. That's why for the atheist, his view of death is completely different from ours. For him, death is merely the absence or the end of physical life. And so for the atheist, the difference between an unconscious and apparently irrecoverably unconscious person on the one hand and a dead person on the other is minimal. For the atheist, the man who is unconscious and apparently will remain so, is very little different from the man who is dead. But for the Christian, that is not the case. For the Christian, this man is still living and his soul is still in his body. The man who has died, his soul at the point of death, departed from the body then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 so the Christian and the atheist have a different view of what man is they have a different view of human life they have a different view of what death is and so the atheist feels free in his desire to be as God and in the place of God as Genesis 3 tells us to define meaningful human life and when there is valid human life 
worthy of protection. So the atheist starts from a completely different standpoint. Human life sim is simply physical and whether it's worth preserving is a matter of his judgment. And so with the infant, the atheist arrogantly asserts at what point in the pregnancy the child shall be treated as a human being and protected accordingly. Now the Christian must reject that. The Christian doesn't admit for one moment that man has the right to draw a line on the basis of his own invention as to when in a pregnancy the child shall be treated as a human being. The Bible tells us when human life begins. And so we reject the idea of even some professing Christians that we can determine by scientific observation when the soul becomes present. We cannot. It is not the function of the scientist by observing the physical child, the physical uh, and uh, observable physical form of the child to determine when the soul begins. It is not within his competence to do that. God alone can tell us when the soul, which is invisible, is present. Only God can tell us. That's why in the case of twins, even before there is a difference in the uh, womb that is detectable by man, God knows what he's doing. God knows there's going to be twins. God can cause there to be two souls, even though there is no discernible indication that twins are present to man. That brings us fourthly. The Bible tells us that the infant in the womb is to be treated as fully human from conception onwards. The Bible tells us that the infant in the womb is to be treated as fully human from conception onwards. And I want to expound the biblical teaching because I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, as is only too obvious, I'm a minister of the Word of God. But the Word of God answers this question, not scientific inquiry. Let us consider, firstly, the Bible nowhere sets before us the concept of a soulless but living human body. The Bible nowhere sets before us the concept of a soulless but living human body. The only bodies that are without a soul in Scripture are the bodies of those who have died. Even in the case of Adam, his creation was not a staggered two-stage two affair. Genesis 2 verse 7 And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now the word soul there is a Hebrew word, nephesh, that isn't always easy to define exactly. It doesn't always refer to the spirit as distinct from the body, but it does refer to the person. So in Psalm 103 verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. There you have uh, standard Hebrew parallel lines, uh, the uh, Hebrew poetry often expresses the same idea twice in, in different forms. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So my soul is equivalent to all that is within me. And the point is that Adam, though not conceived and born like us, was a complete human being from the start. Then moving to Exodus chapter 21. 
Exodus 21 and verse 22. Exodus 21 verse 22 to 25. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judge is determined. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Now then, going back to verse 22 in this phrase, so that her fruit depart from her. What does this phrase mean? Does this refer to a miscarriage and the mischief envisaged only relates to the mother. Is it saying, well, if she has a miscarriage, but the mother's all right, then all's well. Does the life for life, tooth for tooth and so on, only apply to something that might happen to the mother as a result of the miscarriage? Or does it mean, if the child is born prematurely, and the child and mother are all right, then all is well, but if there is damage to the child or the mother, then life for life, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and so on. Because of injury done not simply to the mother, but to the child. So does the fruit departing mean a miscarriage, which is not regarded as a death, or is it referring to the birth of the child, and to the state of the child, living, dead, harmed, injured, whatever, as well as the mother, as being something for which the man must give account. The man responsible in this brawl between two men. Well, let us consider firstly, the Hebrew word for miscarriage is not used. There is a Hebrew word for miscarriage, but that's not the word used when it says her fruit depart from her. Some of the modern translations actually render it miscarriage, but they've no business doing that. The New American Standard Bible, the Revised Standard Version, the Living Bible, the New English Bible, all translate it miscarriage. But there's a different word for miscarriage. It doesn't say that. That's an interpretation imposed in the translation, which is wrong. The word depart from her is used of childbirth elsewhere in scripture. Genesis 25 and verse 25. Genesis 25 verse 25. The birth of Esau and Jacob. Verse 25, Genesis 25. And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment they, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. Now, that phrase came out in verse 25, and in verse 26 is the same Hebrew word translated go forth in our text. And here it's referring not to a miscarriage, but to a birth. The same is true in Genesis 38 and verse 29 the birth of Pharez and Zara, Genesis 38 verse 29 and it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold his brother came out and she said how hast thou broken forth this breach be upon thee therefore his name was called Pharez and afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand and his name was called Zara again the phrase came out is the same word rendered departed from in our text. The word is used of a stillbirth in Numbers uh, chapter 12 and verse 12 where Aaron speaks for, uh, for Miriam and says, Let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb.
In other words, the phrase come out or depart from simply implies birth, not a miscarriage. Now, going back to our text in Exodus 21 and verse 22, when we read there, if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her and yet no mischief follow, it isn't talking about a miscarriage and no mischief to the mother. It's saying if the child is born and there is no mischief to the child or the mother, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. But then in verse 23, and if any mischief follow, that is not just to the mother, but to the child as well, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for for foot. So if the mother dies, the man who injured her is responsible for the death of the mother as a human being. If the child dies, then the man who wounded her is responsible for the death of the child as the death of a human being. It is the loss of a life. And so the infant in the womb, in that passage, is being treated as a human being as well as the mother. And there is no distinction in the text as to the point in the pregnancy that is in view. It doesn't say after so many weeks or anything like that, then the child is treated as a human being. It simply speaks of a woman with child. The implication is that if the woman is pregnant, then the child in the womb is a human being all through the pregnancy and is to be treated as such if a man injures the woman and there is harm to her or the child. third consideration here we are sinners from conception we are sinners from conception Psalm 51 and verse 5 Psalm 51 verse 5 behold I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me and the word conceive here is a word that definitely refers to conception as we understand it. It's actually a word connected with the procreative act. So there's no question that it's referring to conception to the very beginning of the embryo. It is used elsewhere in scripture of cattle in Genesis 30 and verse 41 who of course have no souls and so it cannot refer to any later point and yet David says that he was a sinner at conception now if he was a sinner at conception he must have been a person at conception sin cannot exist without sinners and people and persons there's no such thing as sin without persons. And the uniqueness of the sinlessness of Christ's human nature is traced back to conception by the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1, 18 to 22 and Luke 1, 26 to 38. It was because of the uniqueness of his conception that he was free from both original guilt and corruption. In Psalm 139, David speaks of himself as a person as he developed in his mother's womb. Psalm 139, which we read, verse 13, For thou possessest my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. He says, covered me, not just that which became me, me. 
I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. I was made, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. It was him. It was himself, David, the person who was in his mother's womb. To sum up then, the scriptures speak consistently of the child in the womb as a person, as a sinner, though capable of being filled with the Holy Spirit while in the womb, like John the Baptist, Luke 1, 13, 17. And they do so from conception onwards. The scriptures speak of a woman being with child. That's all. She is with child from conception to birth. No distinction is made regarding any point in the pregnancy to give any indication of any sort that the child only becomes a human being at some point subsequent to conception. To kill the unborn child is to kill a human being. Abortion and all birth control that involves the destruction of a conceived embryo is killing a human being. Should this then be classed as murder? Well, the answer is very simple. To kill a human being, to avoid risk to another human being, is murder, is it not? To kill one human being, to avoid risk to another, is murder. To kill a human being, to prevent injury or risk of injury to body or mind to another, that's murder, is it not? To kill a human being because he is or may be handicapped is murder. We use the term handicapped to describe above average handicap, handicap. But because we're fallen, because of the fall and the curse of God, uh, there is a sense in which we are all handicapped. The fall affects all of us in different ways. But to kill someone because their handicap is greater than average is murder. <coughs> and the fact is that to kill someone because of a risk to the mental health of another is murder. But you know, even that has been interpreted to mean nothing more than that the mother is upset and doesn't want the child. And that has often been enough to say, well, there's a risk to her mental health. She's upset. She doesn't want the child. So the child must be killed. Now that is murder. Of course, even within murder, some sins are more heinous than others. One of the worst cases I heard of, uh, apparently took place a few, just a few years ago, was of a professional couple. They had three children, and they did want a fourth child, and the woman became pregnant, but you see, it clashed with their skiing holiday that they'd arranged. It wasn't that they didn't want a fourth child even. They did, but not so as to clash and spoil their arranged skiing holiday. And the doctor refused to help have a, them have, have an abortion. 
and the general medical council apparently criticized the doctor for his interfering attitude. The abortion clinic is just a human abattoir for the destruction of children. That's all. It is a sophisticated human abattoir to slaughter unborn children. But it has to be said that the debate is shifting. We've been seeing to show that the child in the womb is a human being from conception onwards and of course for us that means the child must not be killed. And much of the debate with the pro-abortion people in the past has been on that basis that they claim no, at an early stage the child is not viable and so on and it's not a real human being. The vanguard of the pro-abortion movement are not even saying that anymore. They're not even bothering to say that in the early stages of pregnancy the child isn't a human being. They're not saying that now. Or the, 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 some of them, they're more uh, outspoken proponents. The pretense is gone. The humanists are coming out in their true colours. They're now starting to say, not perhaps at the grassroots level, but in certain circles, they're now starting to say, we know fine well it's a human being. But the mother still has the right to kill him. In the Evangelical Times recently, it mentions a new book which has been praised by some of America's leading feminists and abortion crusaders. And it says, even in a medically normal pregnancy, the fetus massively intrudes on a woman's body and expropriates her liberty. If the woman does not consent to this transformation and use of her body, the fetus's imposition constitutes injuries sufficient to justify the use of deadly force to stop it. The book, called Breaking Abortion Deadlock, From Choice to Consent, is by Eileen McDonough, who accepts the humanity of the unborn child and says, just as a homeowner concedes the humanity of a thief in the night, but shoots him dead. And you see what the, what the woman is saying? She's saying if a woman is pregnant, yes, the infant is a human being, but it's an intrusion, and though human, she has the right to kill it. This is the height things have reached in wickedness. And the comparison with the thief breaking in in night at night is outrageous. The thief is there by his own choice. He should not be there. He's there with harmful intent. The infant is in the womb because of the mother's activity, either lawfully with her husband or unlawfully with a man she is not married to, and with no malicious intent on the part of the infant. The thing is outrageous, but sin is outrageous. Wickedness is outrageous. Pride, arrogance, the desire of man to be as gods. And this is that wickedness reaching a height. You see, the idea is that a woman has an absolute right over her own body. She doesn't. She is a creature of God. And God tells her what she can do and what she can't do with her body. And if she is expecting a child, God holds her accountable for how she treats that child. The state has authority to put murderers to death from God. We saw that last time. The state does not have authority to legalize the killing of the child in the womb. The child in the womb is a sinner, but has committed no crime. 
with which the civil magistrate must punish that child with the death sentence. And for a government to legalize the murder of thousands of infants in the womb is framing mischief by a law. Psalm 94 verse 20 and it will not be overlooked by God. The rulers have accommodated the maternal and medical murderer instead of protecting the unborn child and attaching the death penalty to those who kill children in the womb. The abortionist should be told that the moment he kills a child he will be treated as a murderer and be put to death. Psalm 106 verse 37 says of Israel, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. The humanist worships himself. He worships man. And he wants the rights of God to be transferred to man. And he sacrifices the children in the womb to gratify that wicked rebellion against God and desire to displace God. That is what the abortion movement is all about. We have become like Israel as a people our hands are full of blood even of the sons and daughters of this people. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord, and shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? We ought to cry mightily to God that he would not stir up all his wrath and pour out his spirit that the abortionist mother and doctor will be brought to repentance and that the people will be brought to repentance of this great wickedness in the sight of God and may the Lord have mercy upon our nation. Amen.